द वर्ल्ड इज अंडर गोइंग रैपिड ट्रांसफॉर्मेशन जियो पोलिटिकली स्पीकिंग वी हैव सीन डेवलपमेंट्स लाइक द राइज ऑफ इंडिया एंड चाइना देर कॉन्फ्लिक्स हैपनिंग इन यूरोप दिस द कोविड क्राइसिस एज वेल विद मी इज द लिथुएनियन एम्बेसडर टू टॉक अबाउट द जियो पोलिटिक्स ऑफ टूडे बट ऑल्सो चाइना विच हैज बीन अ कॉज ऑफ वरी फॉर मेनी कंट्रीज मैम वेलकम टू वी ऑन माई फर्स्ट क्वेश्चन टू यू एंड ओबियस क्वेश्चन इज द डेवलपमेंट्स वी हैव सीन in past few days the comments made by the chinese ambassador in france is something uh, that has been the top story in europe and there has been a clarification that has come from china distancing itself from those remarks saying that they respect the sovereignty of all the countries how do you see this back and forth by the chinese on a certain subject Right. Thank you very much for having me over. Well, we have uh, really reacted with uh, a lot of concern. You may have seen my minister, my ministry, and the three Baltic states foreign ministers, as well as many other, uh, you know, foreign ministers from from Europe, have reacted, uh, rejecting that you know statement of the ambassador of uh, China in France. uh and uh, we've really learned with dismay about uh, you know the narrative which is totally hostile against us which is hostile against the international law and then uh, UN charter and we have very clearly said that uh we have also noted the clarification issued by the ministry of foreign affairs of china this morning but as we speak i think uh, chinese envoys in a number of countries are being summoned to give a wider explanation because in fact this is not just uh, i mean what we could say a blunder by uh, you know a, a person who is not a private person after all but it's also a statement which has been made uh, against uh, raging war uh, in uh, you know of, of russia against ukraine so uh, you know we are noting that the, such statements not only derail the international law by and large but uh, repeat the narrative of a aggressive country which is uh, an aggressor in in this war and it's very unfortunate so uh, you know to us i think we evaluate this um, you know as um, as something in the you know that happens in the wider context mm-hmm. first of all i would like to travel back to uh, you know beijing olympics and the opening day february uh, you know 4th uh 2021 when china and, and russia issued uh, a, a joint statement on the new era in international uh relations and just you know a, a couple of weeks later the beijing is open uh, beijing olympics is is closing and russia is starting the war which unintentionally brings us to look at the whole uh, chronology Uh, that's one thing and certainly you know this is unacceptable and it's uh, china owes us a, a very important very you know extensive explanation on that mm-hmm. uh, the ambassadors or the charge of affairs in various baltic states have been summoned so essentially what message the baltic states or lithuania is sending to beijing in the aftermath of these comments that this statement of the uh, representative of china in uh, one of the european countries is unacceptable it's uh, very wrong and it derails international law and hum- uh, united nations charter which china is 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 saying it respects and is bound to uh, you know to protect us as a p5 member mm-hmm. you also mentioned ma'am you have noted the clarification but will you agree with that clarification do you think that clarification has maybe eased uh, the worry over the comments i mean is it settled will you buy the chinese narrative over the clarification well let's see i think going back and forth it already makes us worry a lot so we need to again evaluate the, the wider perspective uh in our case we have a national experience with china where you know again you know my my minister tweeted uh, last night also that such statements are the reason why we do not trust china being a credible possible you know mediator or peacemaker in in ukraine because it has clearly sided with its argument with uh, with one side 
uh, that's one thing. Second thing, uh, nationally my country has experienced a lot of coercion, economic, political, diplomatic and whatnot, you know. Uh, therefore, again, for us it's a wider context of how we are going to evaluate it. But, uh, you know, it is also an important signal to, to Europeans mm -hmm. to look at it in its totality, not as a single isolated statement, but rather totality of things that have been said and done against uh, member states of mm -hmm. European Union. Mm -hmm. While you have answered my question, but I still like to ask this specific question, it raises Chinese involvement as a neutral arbitrator when it comes to Russia-Ukraine uh, conflict. Can you elaborate on this statement? Um, look, I've already referred to chronology of events in, in 2021. 20, uh, uh, sorry, 22, uh, when Beijing Winter Olympics were happening and then Russia started the war. Mm -hmm. So, you know, uh, we also have to look at it in the wider uh, security initiative that China has presented to us. And for us, a small country, uh, you know, it did pose a question. We sort of felt that, uh, you know, this global security initiative was not really a good thing for a small state like us because it basically uh, talks about uh, zones of influence mm -hmm. uh, and that's precisely uh, what, what is the problem here in these uh, explanations by the, by the Chinese ambassador. You, you have, I think you hear those uh, distance, uh, distant echoes of, of that, you know, uh, division of, 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 of influences mm -hmm. thing and, uh, you know, tying the very vague and rather recent history events to the, you know, position of the government. I think it makes it very, very precarious for mm -hmm. us. So we, of course, we are reacting this way because we feel our sovereignty has been uh, really compromised by such statements. Mm -hmm. uh, Ma'am, coming to a story which is a story of you as the ambassador to China. Uh, you were the Lithuanian ambassador to China. This is a story which is well known in many parts of the world, but not here in Delhi. If you can talk about how you were perhaps the last ambassador of Lithuania to China and why you had to leave. If you can elaborate on the situation on the grounds. Um, yeah, well, I, uh, for now, I am definitely the last ambassador. We also hope we are open to, you know, <laughs> discuss and, 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 and uh, correct the situation with uh, the government of China. But uh, for over, what, two years, we could say we felt a um, series of attempts on the Chinese side to compromise our sovereignty. Precisely, we're talking mm -hmm. again about uh, the same thing, compromising the sovereignty. Uh, because we've experienced a behavior where we as a small country were told very clearly that we won't be allowed by China to do the same things that the other countries have done. Mm -hmm. uh, not to do this, not to do that, because we are small, because we are insignificant, because uh, China has emerged as a, as a stronger China compared to the previous one. So there are several examples, in fact, that I could give. But, you know, of course, the most prominent, and that's what was most in the media, is the issue of opening of uh, Taiwanese non-diplomatic trade office basically in our country uh, which is uh, you know the type of offices that exist I mean in 70 countries at least mm -hmm. uh, as much as we are aware and um, suddenly you know uh, when uh, my government uh, is uh, very keen to have such a trade office because we are keen to you know uh, develop relations economic relations cultural relations with uh, Taiwanese Suddenly China says, no, no, you can't have it because it's a different time. So we allowed others to make mistakes, here I'm quoting, but we won't allow you to make the same mistake. Then, you know, we are forced to react. And then on many other occasions, you can't vote this, you can't vote that, you know, we will, your businesses will suffer. I mean, what is this language? It's a language of, uh, you know, of, of, of coercion and threats. Uh, of course, then there was this episode of leaving uh, 17 plus 1, which my country was the first, uh, you know, to, to do this. But that uh, also related in another way. We, I mean, we've been disappointed by the results. I have to say it did not deliver and I spoke to the media about that. Mm -hmm. The 17 plus 1 did not really deliver any, any economic results. It was supposed to be economic, uh, mm -hmm. you know, forum of engaging with uh, an important economic player like China. 
and it became uh, overly, you know, ideological. Mm -hmm. But also what we felt and what my minister um, said openly, that it became um, the association that started, you know, threatening our unity. Mm -hmm. Because one country would be quietly offered one thing, you know, behind the other's hand and uh, be behind the other's back. And uh, while, of course, European Union countries coordinated a lot uh, and we all felt the same, but, uh, but then later, you know, you realize as a small country like us, for example, we have very small, you know, uh, administration, that you are getting bogged down into endless uh, empty negotiations. Um, you're consuming your resources, which you would be spending, you know, normally for something else uh, much more fruitful. Mm -hmm. Uh, for something that only serves, I don't know whose, you know, uh, interest, but certainly not ours. Mm -hmm. So, of course, this was something that didn't go down very well. And mm -hmm. we felt uh, very quickly after we announced we were withdrawing from this, uh, you know, our businesses started complaining of various hurdles, of various, um, you know, repercussions under the name of sanitary, veterinary, you know, hygiene, whatnot, you know, you would... Uh, stop some 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 particular containers and find the buck there for example in our wheat um, just because my minister discussed uh, the issue of taiwanese involvement in the management of pandemic which was i mean in the first months of pandemic suddenly lithuanian wheat is diagnosed with some sort of a bug which doesn't even exist on our territory it's never never been discovered so you know these sort of things continued for what almost two years and uh, the issue of the uh, taiwanese office a non-diplomatic office, which was still set up despite so many pressures, was the one that, you know, that sort of a flashpoint mm -hmm. where I had to leave. Um, and, uh, you know, we said, okay, we will probably be able to solve it diplomatically by discussing and where were the, those problems. I certainly don't agree that, you know, this was a cause. I would make a, a proposition that <laughs> that was the outcome and the result of a two-year-old pressure mm -hmm. which was building up and my government was left with no other option but just to push back mm -hmm. in our own way, in our small way. Um, but after we stood um, by our decision to allow Taiwanese to come in with a non-diplomatic office, I'm stressing it again, mm -hmm. Uh, because we were sure we are not violating any of our obligations against our one China policy. Then China really switched on the, the new gear, you know, in economic pressure by blocking our exports completely. By, I mean, for some days, uh, even the name of Lithuania disappeared from the custom database mm -hmm. of China, which is uh, ridiculous. But then what happened was uh, they have, um, overnight they have, renamed our embassy and they have renamed their embassy which is probably their right to do but they have renamed our embassy in Beijing uh, from embassy to office of Chargé d'Affaires because ambassadors were already recalled and the, then it is you know these were the very unacceptable uh, you know consequences we had to suffer because at the same time it's 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 quite funny you know the the uh, the next day after mm -hmm. announcement, without actually asking our consent, because in the Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations, you have very clearly the, you know, the names, modalities of embassies or offices need to be worked out bilaterally, mm -hmm. which didn't happen in this case, and we didn't agree, we couldn't. Our law doesn't permit such offices of social mm -hmm. affairs to be set up. Nevertheless, next day, uh, navigation, uh, taxis in Beijing were already using navigation with the name of Office of Charge d'Affaires mm -hmm. uh, of Lithuania. So, you know, that ability to mobilize an outright uh, implementation of, of, of those uh, top-down decisions is, is really uh, I incredible. But then uh, what they actually said that, you know, our diplomats had to return uh, their diplomatic IDs, which made their status precarious. Uh, because, I mean, without a diplomatic idea, a diplomat cannot be, you know, assured in mm -hmm. performing its functions. But the second thing was uh, diplomatic IDs were also our visas. We are visa-free for diplomatic passports. So uh, diplomatic ID is the only uh, document of legal stay in, in China, which means, means that overnight they were left uh, rendered illegal, so to say. Mm -hmm. So we had to recall, or I would almost use the word evacuate everybody overnight in, on the first available flight in the middle of pandemic. That meant several, uh, you know, days uh, uh, fr fr from now. 
So, uh, because we couldn't jeopardize uh, their safety and well-being. Nevertheless, we have not behaved the same way. Uh, the Chinese embassy, um, you know, is functioning in, in mm. uh, my country. And we have a channel, we have sought some dialogue, we are still hopeful that, you know... That Is there any conversation happening between... Yeah, of course, I mean, you know, we really want to, to have a civilized dialogue, but it's proven uh, difficult, difficult, and with these remarks, I think it's proving even more difficult, because in our, in our case, we are the country which evaluates it not just as against the geopolitical context in Europe, but against our own experience, which has been pretty uh, bad. Mm. Ma'am, you used a specific phrase, the language of coercion. Do you think that this language of co coercion is something that will continue when it comes to Beijing? Because is this not Lithuania, it's across the world. India has felt it, countries in ASEAN, South China Sea have also felt it. Do you think that this is something that it's only going to grow? Uh, well, it's a very sad thing to say, in fact, but we definitely not the first one to experience that. Uh, yeah, Australia's case was, you know, a good case before. You have mentioned several others and unfortunately, if this is the situation of things, it's not going to be, we are not going to be the last country either. Now, uh, economic coercion has already been a, a term which has been fixed in, uh, you know, even in the rules and laws that, that um, you know, regulate international trade because uh, what else China did, which was beyond the usual, they have also started uh, after my government again refused to, you know, uh, to go back on, on these decisions. They have started the pressure against third countries. That is, for example, about companies of the third countries who were having presence in Lithuania with factories, you know, production facilities, but also presence in China. Mm -hmm. So they were basically pressurized to quit Lithuania as an investor, you know, investor zone. And that was considered uh, a rude, uh, um, in fact, uh, uh, act against the uh, single market of European Union, mm -hmm. because ultimately it would mean that a company of an ex, you know, country in European Union would need to consider its investments in any of our single zone partners by how China would look at them. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's outrageous. That's why uh, European Commission, on our request and with the support of all the members of European Union, has launched that trade case, you know, uh, in the WTO, immediately after this uh, was, uh, you know, registered as a happening on a rather large scale. So it's a big number of companies who would be pressurized and it's companies who had to import anything from Lithuania for their, suppose, assembly factories mm -hmm. in China, that they had their containers blocked, mm -hmm. if they only contain some little bit of Lithuanian content. So we, uh, you know, very quickly, European Commission launched that, uh, you know, case in the court. Uh, the consultation period had elapsed already because China had denied it was doing anything. So enough material was collected and now it's in the panel waiting decision. But it's, a, you know, it's a behavior which has been qualified as economic coercion, unfortunately. And, and this is clearly economic coercion. Mm -hmm. Ma'am, do you think uh, Europe is divided over China? Because we do see Europe getting dismayed over these remarks. But we also see, see various leaders from Europe engaging with China. And we saw recent comments as well. So do you think a divided Europe is there when it comes to dealing with Beijing? I would not agree it's divided. There could be nuances, but I mean, even India, which has a difficulty, you know, is engaging with China. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, how else? I mean, if we don't want to go at war, we need to engage uh, somehow. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's still, there is still hope that, you know, we can somehow pass that message across that certain behaviors are unacceptable. Meanwhile, there's been a very vigorous debate on whatever you call it, you know, de-risking, mm -hmm. uh, because yes, a number of our partners have been uh, involved in, you know, economically with China uh, to the extent that they are themselves worried what mm -hmm. will happen in case, for example, like we were, you know, what we have experienced has, uh, has been uh, more or less uh, moderate because uh, we didn't have that very huge uh, you know, involvement and in, in a sense, since I was saying that we were disappointed by the outcomes of economic engagement, it turned out to be our lucky mm -hmm. card because at, at the same time we didn't really suffer that much, but there are those who are really deeply involved. So it served and 
I mean, unfortunately, you know, no diplomat wants to be as open as me, but we were forced into a situation where we said, okay, look at our situation. It's a lab of what uh, an unfriendly country can do uh, to another country, especially a smaller one using, you know, so look at it as a, as, a, as a learning tool for you to make your own conclusions. So I think that in Europe, if you look at what we were like two years ago or even one year ago, we have really progressed a lot on sober evaluation of uh, relations with uh, China, with uh, Russia is yet another case because many countries were very dependent on energy you know, from, from Russia. So it's this de-risking which needs to be taking place, it is taking place. It's a slow uh, you know, uh, process and it's a painful process also, you need to pay for it. Um, you know, again, I'm, I've said it many times, you know, there are things that might be painful and costly, but your independence and sovereignty is priceless because that's how it is. So you need to pay that price. Mm -hmm. uh, Ma'am, since you mentioned Russia, there are reports that there is a plan by the Ukrainians to launch an offensive and obviously there will be a reaction to it as well. Uh, are you seized of the current developments when it comes to these plans of offensive being launched by either side? I would not like to comment on it because it clearly goes beyond my competence. Mm -hmm. But how do you see or assess the current situation? It's been one year since the conflict started in uh, Europe, the Russia-Ukraine conflict. There is no sign of it getting halted anyways. What's your view like? Well, in our view, I mean, we know that our own existential, uh, uh, you know, uh, wish or will our aim is that uh, Ukraine wins. Mm -hmm. So we understand that it's going to take time, but Ukraine, in a sense, you know, in that sense in which Russia launched attack, it has already won. It has won, it has retained its territory, its full sovereignty. It's being able, you know, to rally a, a lot of support and it will be uh, continuing, you know. So uh, it has already won now on the territories that uh, Ukraine wants back. It's international, which is on their side. Uh, we'll see. Uh, it will be for the Ukrainians to decide that. You know, it's it's for absolutely for them to to see up to which point they want to fight, and we will support them. And when I'm saying we, it's not just Lithuania, but I guess a huge number of countries in the very sort of you know wide uh, transatlantic space that will support that because it will be Ukrainian uh, you know decision. Mm -hmm. But my last question to you is about India-Lithuania relationship. While you've talked at length when it comes to China-Lithuania relationship, uh, they're reducing their engagement, trying to pressurize third country. India, on the other hand, has increased engagement. We have opened an embassy, our diplomats have gone. If we can talk about that and also uh, the linkages, the, the Sanskrit-Lithuanian links between the two countries. Uh, well, it's a very wide question. Uh, first of all, we're very happy to witness uh, the uh, opening, but not just opening, but operationalization of Indian Embassy in, in Vilnius. It has happened on the 31st of March, so we are, what, in the fourth week of, of its existence, so we really are, are, are very happy. We uh, welcome our Indian colleagues in, in Lithuania. Uh, of course, you know, we will need to, you know, be again, uh, that the relationship has finally acquired a few fully mutual, uh, you know, uh, level where the two embassies are functioning. Uh, on our side, our priorities are what economic engagement, certainly it's uh, everybody's priority with India, especially, uh, which is a bright spot, you know, in the world economy, which is a huge market, which is a huge uh, said to be the biggest, uh, you know, uh, country, most populated country, but in all, I mean, areas, not just that. I mean, it's it's a, a great power which is which is back on the the table of, of global power. So we salute that, and, and in that perspective, we also see uh, that you know India is coming to Lithuania is very uh, very uh, promising. Now, uh, while economic diplomacy is, uh, is a priority, of course, we need to set priorities within priorities. Mm -hmm. So for us on our side, but I hope that, and, and I quite guess that it will be the same on the Indian side, would be high-tech partnership, because we are clearly seeing the patterns of trade and you know, other economic engagement in services and so on. 
uh, being directed towards high tech. We have emerged as a high tech country. We have traditionally been, been good on, on lasers, but recently, uh, you know, fintech, we have become the capital of fintech once UK left EU. Uh, so in the EU, we are now number one. Uh, biotech has been uh, emerging and uh, the latest star project now the companies that are selling in India are you know uh, uh, in selling internet of things and and really sophisticated high-tech engineering uh, we have also acquired the semicon technology from the Taiwanese so we will be you know manufacturing certain types of semiconductor chips mm -hmm. in Lithuania that only you know boats for a very very uh, good partnership with India because whatever is of excellence in this on the small scale that we are can be very nicely enlarged and scaled up in a, in a country like India which has been digitalizing at incredible rate which has been becoming high-tech you know mm. in all possible respects so between one small high-tech country and another huge high-tech country we are finding a lot of uh, niche uh, cooperation yeah. and coming back to cultural diplomacy and public diplomacy we have definitely focused on on that uh, we think that uh, especially for us because lithuania is not yet uh, so well known in india uh, we have um, really started some of the uh, sort of uh, you know linguistic diplomacy mm -hmm. things uh, that you have witnessed so uh, the dictionary of identical Sanskrit Lithuanian words because they are sister languages mm -hmm. again scientifically proven uh, then this uh, street art wall of Lithuanian and Sanskrit identical words I hope that would lead into more research on mm -hmm. on you know the the subject of similarities of languages but not only that I mean we need to really uh, you know do much more on public diplomacy because I think even the Indian culture is it's, it's very popular in mm -hmm. Lithuania but uh, you know, sky's the limit to how to make it more popular and more probably, uh, you know, known as not just a country of uh, very rich uh, culture and civilization, but also as a country of high tech, mm -hmm. of, uh, you know, digitalization and so on. So much needs to be done and public diplomacy, culture, you know, linguistic ties only help any other ties and mutual understanding. Well, thank you so much, ma'am, uh, for speaking to Vion, uh, especially on a very short notice and talking about at length when it comes to China concerns, but also the India-Lithuania relationship, which I believe both sides are eagerly looking at. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you for having me. Thanks, ma'am.